Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Megan Lowry. I am a media officer at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. Uh, thank you for joining us here today this afternoon for a webinar on the report that was just released Wednesday titled Airborne Platforms to Advance NASA Earth System Science Priorities. You can now download a copy of the full report and other supporting materials at www.nap.edu and a recording of this webinar will be available on our website in the coming weeks. For those of you who are not familiar with the U.S. National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, we are private nonprofit institutions that provide independent objective analysis and advice to the U.S. to solve complex problems and inform public policy decisions related to science, technology, and medicine. For each requested study, panel members are chosen for their expertise and experience, and they serve pro bono to carry out the study statement of task. The reports that result from the study represent the consensus view of the committee, and they must undergo external peer review before they're released, as did this report. I have a few members of the committee that wrote the report here with me today uh, to talk about their work, but before I introduce them, I want to go over just a few reminders about the session. Um, please note that the webinar is scheduled to last one hour, so we'll start off with a presentation from the committee summarizing their findings, um, and then we'll open it up to any questions you may have afterwards. And to ask a question, you can just click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type in your question. Um, and you can submit a question at any time during the presentation. All right, so now I'd like to introduce uh, the members of the committee that wrote the report who are here with us today. Uh, Bill Brun, Chair of the Committee and Distinguished Professor of Meteorology and Atmospheric Science at the Pennsylvania State University. Uh, Sarah Gilley, Professor at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, University of California, San Diego. Jim Crawford, Senior Scientist for Atmospheric Chemistry at NASA's Langley Research Center. Ann Nolan, Professor at the University of Nevada, Reno. Zong Liu, Schuler Foscu, Professor of Earth Sciences at Southern Methodist University. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Brun. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, next slide, please. Okay, so what is the Earth system? This is, this is really the focus of this study and really the focus of a lot of our research. Basically, it's everything around us. It's the trees that we see, it's this land that we see, it's the ocean, it's the water, it's the air. All those things make up this very complex system. And what we're interested in is that it's constantly changing. It's constantly changing on a variety of time scales, all the way from sub-second, all the way up to millions of years. And all these are connected together. So this is a very difficult system to study and we need to observe it in order to have any, any chance of really understanding what's happening. Now, these observations uh, come from a variety of sources. And so what we're talking about today is the integrated observing system and particularly how aircraft measurements uh, and airborne measurements fit within that context. Next slide, please. So uh, NASA plays a major role in their system science uh, in, in the United States and the world. And uh, part of its role is essentially to have a fleet of aircraft that essentially fill that, that need for measurements of certain types. And so the, the, the fleet that NASA maintains is probably one of the most extensive and diversified uh, for Earth system science uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, and it's really important to, as an, as an element of sort of the Earth observing system. Next slide, please. Okay, so the basic science that we take and the roadmap that we're using is from essentially the Decadal Survey of Earth Science and Application from Space, which was in 2017. And this, this it was aimed really at space-based observation needs. On the other hand, before it talked about the needs, it talked about the science that had to be done. And so uh, it looked at all different areas, what, what needed to be measured there in order to solve complex problems, and also to look at what was happening in terms of interdisciplinary science, which is an emerging field that's been there, but it's gonna be growing in the future as we try to sort of resolve uh, societal needs as they come up. Uh, next slide, please. So <clears throat> the, what is the integrated observing system? 
It consists of several elements that are listed here, on, and you can see them in, in this figure. It obviously has the space-borne observations because that's, that's what NASA does. And it also has surface measurements. That includes uh, 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 remote sensing of, of, of systems and, and ground-based systems and ocean-based systems and even systems that look underneath the ocean surface. And the aircraft then are a link between those two, the space-based and the surface-based. And so it consists of piloted aircraft, both uh, propeller and, and jet. And, and now increasingly, uh, even more uh, uh, um, uncrewed aircraft systems, which is shown over on the right, and then also balloons, which is shown over on the left. And so these make up a lot of the observations. In addition to that, they're laboratory studies that, that feed information into all aspects of these observations and then understanding them. And finally, all this is kind of put together with, with modeling of various sorts, where the modeling sort of is really embodies everything we know about the Earth system and also allows us to predict what will happen as the Earth system keeps changing. And last of all, and most important of all, is the people that do all of these things and make all of these things work. And we need a diverse array of people with a diverse array of skills to do this. So next slide, please. Okay. So uh, a topic of this report is really the NASA DC-8 aircraft, which was acquired in 1987. And its very first mission was to go help the uh, study and understand and test the hypothesis of chlorofluorocarbons destroying uh, ozone in the ozone hole. Uh, it's a long range and heavy lift aircraft, which means it can go far and it can carry many people and many instruments. It has many ports and whatnot to try to, uh, uh, that many instruments can use. And, um, and it can fly all ranges in terms of up and down in, in the lower atmosphere. And so because of all these strengths, it can, it can really address some really unique questions. So far, there have been more than 140 campaigns, and the use has been evolving. So if you look over on, on, on the right, you can see for different decades what the main uses of the, the DC-8 were. And you see that in, in the 87 to, to 99, in that period, that really it was a lot of surface measurements for ecology and for surface science and for um, uh, uh, water and energy. And uh, the atmospheric composition was important and weather was important. And then in 2000 and 2009, it was mostly atmospheric composition and, uh, and weather surface still and, and, and growing cryosphere. And then in 2010, 2019, you see it was cryosphere was dominant with atmospheric composition next in weather. So you see there's been an emergence and a change over time of which areas have used the aircraft the most, but we see that they all have been involved with that. And so the picture on the left is really from a, a, a pole to pole study looking at atmospheric composition. And you can see that this aircraft can carry many, many scientists uh, operating many, many uh, instruments at the same time. Next slide, please. So the, the committee was charged at sort of looking at uh, a studying with the idea of guiding NASA in, in their choice of future investments in suborbital airborne facilities with a particular role on this idea of the large airborne facility, such as a NASA DC-8 that has this unique combination of many, many different characteristics, including uh, long range and heavy lift and vertical profiling uh, and uh, um, other properties like and being able to carry a lot of people and uh, all those properties. And so the DC-8, of course, is at the end of its useful life. Now, in addition to that is uh, interest in how can smaller aircraft be used and, and how can new uh, newly available platforms like UASs and balloons make contributions to answering these science questions that are being asked. Okay, next, please. So, um, the Academy put together a committee uh, uh, that has very, very diverse uh, uh, backgrounds, discipline backgrounds, and, and technical backgrounds. And 
Uh, Shui Chen was a co-chair, and then Chrissy Boring, Catherine Cahill, James Crawford, Dave Fahey, Sarah Gilly, Von de Grubasek, uh, George Komar, Eric Court, Zhang Lu, Greg McFarquhar, Walt Meyer, Charles Miller, Ann Nolan, Bayat Schmidt, and Susan Houston were all members of this committee. And so with this committee, uh, we had expertise in atmospheric chemistry, meteorology, climate science, cryosphere, land surface properties, hydrology, ecology, physical oceanography, geosciences, as well as expertise in, in satellite-based uh, Earth observations, in aviation, in UASs, in technology and instrument development, ground-based observ uh, uh, observations, and modeling. Next slide, please. So the study approach was to have virtual meetings from May 2020 to March 2021. And I think everyone knows why they were all virtual. Uh, and we had uh, information gathering workshop, which was in July of 2020, with a request for written input, which we got some several different, uh, uh, we, we got uh, input from several different people for that in summer 2020. The sessions were aligned on the three days along the lines of what we decided were sort of three very important discipline areas that were based on, on uh, ESAS, the decadal survey uh, in different areas. And these were the ones that we thought really had used and were likely to use into the future uh, uh, aircraft as part of their research. And so they were surface dynamics and geological hazards and disasters, uh, ecosystem change, both on land and ocean, air quality and atmospheric chemistry, chemistry coupled to dynamics, physics and dynamics for improving weather forecasts, sea level rise in a changing climate and coastal impacts, and coupling of the water and energy cycles. So these are what we chose as disciplinary areas uh, representing uh, the major, major, major components of, of the ESA study upon which everything is based. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so what we did first was we took the ESAS questions, which are in the decadal survey report, so 2017, and we said, okay, what needs to be measured? What variables need to be measured? And that's over on the table on the right. And then uh, we mapped that onto questions where aircraft and airborne measurements had a major role in, in essentially helping to, to answer those questions. And so this is an example from uh, sea level rise and coastal impacts here. We have one for each area. And so we just chose this one by random to show, but they all have essentially the same sort of mapping all the way from ESIS, all the way over to sort of what, what the aircraft can do. And then to be respons responsive to our statement of task, we then ask the following questions. Which questions are best addressed with large aircraft? Which ones are well suited for a combination of smaller aircraft? What about other platforms like balloons and, and UASs? And finally, what is the benefit, uh, what other benefits are there to Earth system science and applications uh, that, that the airborne platforms provide? And this just includes things like um, like uh, satellite cali calibration and validation, instrument development, um, model testing, and, and essentially workforce training and development. Next slide, please. But we know that uh, we have these six science areas and we recognized early on that really there's uh, science and even emerging science that we haven't even thought of yet that's going to require interdisciplinary work and interdisciplinary research where you take expertise from different areas and you bring it together to solve a problem that's at the boundaries of these, these six areas that we set up. And so um, we're looking at uh, <clears throat> collaborations across these. And of course, there are many, many of these uh, sort of interdisciplinary science that exist, and we know there are many that are going to come in the future. And so in this section here, we sort of tried to lay out two examples where large aircraft could play a role. And these were just uh, examples and not uh, prescriptive in any way. And in all these cases, like in many cases that we've already done, 
we, we know that there are going to be uh, impacts on societal decision making. So that the science actually is connected uh, to, to uh, societal decisions. And so we needed a section on interdisciplinary to look, look to the future, as well as to um, answer some of the science priority questions from ESIS. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Phil. I'm gonna continue from here. Next slide, please. So as, as Bill said, the study was built around six science areas and the committee um, looked at ESAS questions that arose from those where a large aircraft such as a, a DC-8 or airplane with DC-8 capabilities would be helpful. The study found that to meet basic disciplinary needs, a large aircraft was really essential for three of the areas, atmospheric physics and dynamics, for atmospheric chemistry, and for the atmospheric component of coupling of the water and energy cycles. And for this, the aircraft plays a role for simultaneous observations of rapidly changing phenomena. Uh, it has a payload size and flexibility that allows large instruments to be put on an airplane to make measurements. And it has the long range capability to access remote locations. For three of the areas, the committee found that the, a large aircraft was useful for innovative approaches to multi-instrument remote sensing. Um, and it could be envisioned um, to address some key questions. So this applied for ecosystem change, both for land and ocean for surface dynamics, geological hazards and disasters, and for sea level rise in a changing climate and coastal impacts. So for these areas, a large aircraft is valuable because it has it's able to do multi-sensor measurements and to access remote regions. And then for the interdisciplinary science that the committee looked at, an aircraft provides flexibility to accommodate and enable new approaches and needs for multi-instrument and air deployable payloads and to collect novel combinations of observations simultaneously. Next slide, please. Beyond the science questions, the committee looked at, at the other things that a large aircraft can do. Some of that involves instrument development. Uh, so instruments that are likely to be large and heavy that might be designed to go on a, a satellite eventually. Um, it may need a large amount of power, it can be tested from a large aircraft with um, operated by the people on board. Um, a large aircraft is also essential for testing future measurement concepts that may be tied to multi-sensor capabilities or that allow new discoveries. And having a large aircraft available fosters innovative thinking for comprehensive airborne studies of global atmospheric composition, um, for example, and potentially for other areas in the future. And, um, and there's a real need to have an aircraft large enough to compare new instruments with legacy instruments so that we can verify that legacy instruments that are being replaced um, are or so that we understand the performance of leg legacy instruments relative to the new instruments that are being evaluated. Calibration and validation is an important area for NASA science and for a large aircraft. Uh, and that need is expected to grow. Both airborne and space-based observations um, are, um, are needed for, uh, well, airborne and space-based observations are used for models to constrain chemical transport and climate models to address earth system science questions. And that's an important application. And satellite remote sensing of surface properties of, and phenomena requires um, a large aircraft with multi-sensor payloads to carry out the calibration and validation of the sensors. And that's especially true over remote regions. These needs are likely to become more critical in the future as the satellite observations become more complex and require more complex satellite calibration and validation strategies. Uh, 
training is a big area. A large aircraft will continue to have the benefit of allowing a large number of investigators on board to run instruments, and it provides opportunities for students and early career scientists to participate in airborne missions. A large, a large aircraft is also an effective facility for attracting, training, and developing a diverse workforce, which will be critical for attacking rapidly advancing um, or for addressing advancing technologies and meeting the challenges to um, to study our complex earth system in a changing climate. And then the other thing the report emphasizes is that there are plenty of unexpected things that happen in the earth system. Uh, unexpected phenomena can have detrimental effects on human health, on society, and on the economy, and they need immediate research responses so that we can address the challenges they raise. So the example of the Antarctic ozone hole is a good one where the fact that the, a large aircraft was available um, and the instruments were available meant that it, the science community was able to rapidly respond and carry out observations uh, to address and figure out how to mitigate that problem. Next slide, please. So the recommendations from, that come from this are that NASA should acquire, maintain, and operate a large aircraft as part of its aircraft fleet in order to address priority questions developed for the 2017 Earth Science and Applications from Space to Cato Survey, and to support satellite calibration and validation, computer model testing, instrument development, and workforce training and development. Next slide, please. In addition, the second recommendation is to meet NASA objectives. A new large aircraft must have characteristics that are comparable to or better than those of the DC-8 in terms of payload capacity, altitude and distance ranges, instrument sampling, port versatility, instrument integration, and durability. Next slide, please. Uh, now, what that means requires a little thought, and the committee has provided a list of essential characteristics and um, desired values of some of the characteristics for a, a large aircraft. These characteristics are not meant to be prescriptive, but they provide guidance for selecting a new large aircraft. And the committee recognizes that optimizing uh, performance specifications of a new large aircraft may involve some trade-offs. Uh, but the basic combination of these characteristics is essential. So that includes having an instrument payload weight of 14,000 kilograms or more, uh, flight duration on the order of 12 hours, a range of 10,000 kilometers to uh, reach remote regions of the world, an altitude ceiling of at least 12 and a half kilometers, and the capability to profile vertically from the planetary boundary layer to, to the altitude ceiling, in-flight seating for on the order of 42 or more researchers in addition to the crew, instrument payload integration and operation flexibility, durability, precision autopiloting to allow exact repeats of the same ground tracks, for example, and in-flight satellite communication links to operations on the ground. Next slide, please. Uh, a large aircraft is just part of the NASA fleet, but it's only one key contributor to a very diverse array of airborne platforms platforms that are needed to address Earth system science objectives. Uh, airborne platforms with diverse specifications of payload, range, altitude, onboard pilot, and operational flexibility form a complementary fleet currently that meets a wide range of mission objectives, um, often in collaboration with airborne platforms and the fleets of other research agencies, private organizations, and other countries. A substantial amount of past airborne science has used more than one airborne platform together in research studies, often deploying different types of aircraft to perform different roles. And NASA often contributes its platforms, uh, including the DC-8, uh, in collaborative efforts with other US agencies, other countries, universities, and private organizations. So, these efforts will become more essential as Earth system science questions become interdisciplinary, more interdisciplinary and more complex. 
and a new large aircraft capability and NASA is expected to continue to play an essential and enabling role in many of these interdisciplinary efforts. Airborne science today um, is accomplished using many aircraft that are smaller than a DC-8 for several reasons listed on this slide, um, including the payloads are small, um, rapid deployment is needed, um, the observing requirements for some combinations of remote sensing instruments may require different aircraft um, and it may be desirable to have them in different operations. And the DC-8 uh, has a high operating cost that exceeds some available budgets. Uh, so it's, it's part of a broad portfolio. Next slide, please. Um, and um, UASs are also an important part of this. They're being deployed for a wide range of in situ and remote sensing applications. As sensors continue to get smaller and lighter, the role of UASs in Earth system science research is expected to expand. Large helium filled balloons are also important. They're currently the only way to sample the middle stratosphere in situ. And for some stratospheric wind conditions, they can stay aloft over a specific region for many days to allow in situ or remote sensing. So while there are promising developments in high altitude, long duration UASs and, and in steerable balloons, these technologies may not advance quickly enough to contribute significantly to earth system science research within the next decade. Next slide, please. That leads to the recommendation that NASA should continue operating a diverse array of airborne platforms in addition to a large aircraft as part of the broader government, university, and commercial fleet in order to meet the evolving airborne needs for advancing Earth system science research. Next slide, please. Then, um, as Bill mentioned earlier, an important part of the ESAS 2017, an important part of this study was to look at integrating themes and the role of, in this case, in the role of aircraft to address some of these interdisciplinary science topics. Uh, the report covers two of the two examples, wildfires, which are shown on this slide, and extreme precipitation and flooding. In the case of um, wildfires, Climate change combined with weather, past fire suppression efforts, and other factors have led to hotter, more damaging wildfires in recent years, longer fire seasons, and high price tags. And this has impacts on human health through direct exposure. It has impacts on infrastructure. And it leads to knock-on effects for further hazards, for example, resulting from um, say landslides in, in burned areas after heavy precipitation. So rapid earth system science changes like this highlight the need for interdisciplinary research and for simultaneous measurements. Next slide, please. And that leads to a recommendation that NASA should continue to solicit large aircraft requests that span the breadth of NASA earth system science especially encouraging those for interdisciplinary science across the interfaces of Earth system components with integrated multi-instrument payloads and novel strategies for remote sensing and in situ observations. Earth system science is increasingly interdisciplinary and um, the committee felt that NASA should proactively seek proposals for innovative approaches for using a large aircraft to accomplish interdisciplinary and surface remote sensing in addition to supporting the new disciplinary research. Um, and that by doing this, NASA will increase the impact that a large aircraft can have on achieving NASA's Earth system science research goals. Next slide, please. Training, um, outreach, and workforce development is an important part of what an aircraft can do future advances in NASA Earth system science research depend on the continual emergence growth of early career scientists to develop new measurement concepts, to make measurements, and eventually to take over field studies themselves, themselves um, taking leadership roles. 
So a large aircraft is a really important facility for attracting training and developing this diverse workforce. And it also plays a role in engaging the public because it provides the space to accommodate additional passengers beyond the core scientists and crew needed to carry out the mission. Next slide, please. So recommendations that come from this are that NASA is encouraged to build on the training and outreach opportunities it has, has established using the DC-8 and use a future large aircraft to expand its efforts to attract, develop, and train the next generation workforce with particular emphasis on diversity, equity, and inclusion to foster capacity to conduct international Earth system science research and to inform the public. And NASA is encouraged to continue building on its use of the large aircraft capacity to enable scientists with next generation measurement concepts and especially early career scientists to become active participants in earth system science research, even beyond airborne science research. Next slide, please. So some concluding thoughts. Airborne observations have enabled exciting and transformative science for the past three decades. A large aircraft is expected to remain essential to NASA's Earth System Science research to fulfill the vision of ESAS and to embrace emerging science and technology and train future generations of scientists. A new large aircraft will provide capacity to address increasingly complex science questions, enable innovative observations using multiple platforms and multiple instruments, and address growing societal needs for decision-making in a rapid changing climate and with rising seas in the coming decades. Next slide, please. This study, of course, would not have been possible without an enormous number of people, including the committee members and National Academy staff. Um, the report review monitors, whose names are on the screen, and report reviewers kept this report honest and their help was absolutely invaluable. And of course, we thank the study sponsor, who is NASA. Um, and that's the end of our presentation. We're going to take questions now. We thank you for attending and we welcome questions, which. Yes, thank you all for that wonderful presentation. Um, uh, as Sarah said, uh, so we're going to open, open it up to questions now. Um, if you'd like to ask a question again, you can do so just by clicking Q&A at the bottom of your screen um, and typing in your question. Uh, so the first one that I want to start us off with um, is uh, for those of us who are not working at this field at the moment, uh, what is Earth Systems Research and what can we learn from it? Uh, and do you want to take this one? Thanks. Could you repeat the question, please? Yeah, of course. Um, so just, you know, for those of us in the audience who uh, do not work in this field, um, what is Earth Systems Research? And why is it important and what do we learn from it? Ah, uh, okay. So Earth System, let me just say first what Earth System Science is, and, and then I'll talk about what we learned from Earth System Research. So um, I would say traditionally, years ago, decades ago, we used to think of um, the Earth components as individual disciplines. And oftentimes we would learn and our research would focus on a particular discipline. So, you know, back in the day, oceanographers would only look at the ocean. Atmospheric scientists would only look at the atmosphere. Terrestrial scientists, hydrologists like myself would only look at the, the water. As it, and, and now we've realized it's a whole system. These things are cu fully coupled. So for instance, when I think about water, where does it come from? Well, it depends on where you start. It could start in the ocean and then you have evaporation into the atmosphere, clouds forming and moving and uh, atmospheric dynamics and circulation and precipitation uh, with the water landing on the land surface being used by vegetation, uh, moving into soil moisture, into deep subsurface for groundwater. Uh, and flowing into our rivers and, and so on and being connected to people and uh, all the ecosystems connected. So this is the earth system. It's all of these systems working together with people in, in all of this. And so our research has really transitioned from disciplinary to um, uh, coupled systems. And that's one of the reasons why my part of, the, of this report uh, was called the coupled um, water and energy cycles. And of course, these are all coupled to other cycles like the carbon cycle, for instance. Uh, 
so our next question is, um, to what extent did your committee consider opportunities for these airborne platforms to advance or system research uh, that's sponsored by other federal agencies, uh, NSF, for example, the National Science Foundation? Jim, do you want to take that one? Did you call me on that one, Bill? Yes. Yeah, so one thing that I would acknowledge in this is that the report states pretty clearly that, that uh, the NASA aircraft are very often used uh, in larger efforts along with interagency aircraft. And so uh, many times you see multiple aircraft working on a problem. And so uh, in the sense that uh, those aircraft all come together to tackle the same problems uh, that, that's covered in the report. Thank you. Um, so I'm hoping that you can explain for me uh, how the DCA, or the DC-8, excuse me, um, is used today in climate research, climate change research, and how do you think that your recommendation to continue using another large aircraft um, may impact climate change research? So, um, Sarah, do you want to try that? I can start. Um, the report outlines a very broad way, range of uses for the DC-8 for climate change research. Um, as a table that Bill Bruns showed indicated, um, that usage has changed over time. In the most recent decade, there's been quite a bit of work in the cryosphere, but that's probably changed now again. And a lot of the work with the DC-8 has been atmospheric research. Um, we expect that that will continue to change in the future as new science emerges. Uh, I can add a little bit to that. And again, it's going to be anecdotal because we each have different disciplines. And as Sarah noted, uh, the table in each of the disciplinary chapters of the report all refer to climate related ESAS questions mm -hmm. that we're each trying to address. Uh, but a good example of how climate research benefits from from large platform uh, goes back to the fire example that Sarah mentioned. Uh, for instance, when we flew recently uh, looking at uh, fire activity in the atmosphere as part of FireXAQ, the atmospheric portion of that science was complemented by an instrument on board which could look at the fire radiative power, the energetics of the fire. And, you know, on a smaller aircraft, we could only look at the atmospheric part of the question. But by being able to combine an instrument that looks at the fire behavior on the ground and then combine that with atmospheric measurements of what's coming out of the fire, you begin to see the interdisciplinary aspect of what a large platform can, can enable as an example. Um. I'll add a, one component to that, and that's the fact that the DC-8 can carry a lot of people. And one of the most important things for climate change research is workforce development, because the scientists who are going to be addressing the current and future challenges and uh, need to be trained and need to have that experience of being able to operate instruments in a team environment um, on board uh, a large aircraft. So it has to have large capacity for um, lots of students and and postdocs and so on. Another component of the climate change research is the fact that we are seeing more really unexpected and extreme events. And so we need to be able to deploy a large capacity flying laboratory such as the DC-8 um, in a way that we can really um, capture that, uh, that sort of extreme behavior. For instance, what Jim was saying about wildfire and atmospheric chemistry and dynamics. Um, our next question from, from the audience is, um, a number of replacement aircraft were suggested in the report, um, and the audience is wondering, do these aircraft have the same capabilities as the DC-8 when it comes to flying within hurricanes or um, maybe similar challenging weather conditions um, where you need, uh, you know, on-site observations? Um, what would your response be to that? So, Jim? So I want to emphasize up front that, that this group was not charged with actually identifying a replacement aircraft, but we did refer to a study that NASA commissioned to look into possible future NASA aircraft. And so if you, if you follow the reference in the document, uh, you'll find that there are more than a few possible candidates that would satisfy the requirements of 
uh, looking like and acting like a DC-8 or better. So I would just refer people to the Ozerowski et al. reference as, as some material that can help you look into those possibilities. But that explicitly was not our, in our, our statement of task. It was mostly to say, what do we need to do the science? And that that was, that was the key. And how large aircraft, how uh, smaller aircraft, how new development technologies and UASs and balloons will work into that. And then what are the other benefits? Those are really the, 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 the four main components of our statement of task. And I think this question is in a similar vein, um, but did you have a recommendation as to the expected or recommended lifespan for um, a future large aircraft? No, once again, that's not really within our statement of task. Our statement of task is what is it going to take to do the science that's here and that's evolving through the vision of ESAS? That's, that was really sort of the time scale that we were tasked to look at in particular. Thank you. Um, so one thing I wanted to ask you about, uh, as you were thinking about creating capacity for the unexpected, as you said in the report, um, in airborne platforms research, what kinds of scenarios were you thinking about or imagining as a committee? Uh, you know, research that we might not know that we need now, but that might be essential in the future. Jim. I would just add uh, an example there. So looking at the history of the DC-8 helps with this question of unexpected. IceBridge was a major user of the aircraft in the last decade and was not expected. And so the idea that we had a plane on hand that could satisfy all the other disciplines and shoulder the burden of those bridging observations that, that went really beyond what the current satellite does and, and opened the door to a lot of great research on the cryosphere is a great example of unanticipated use of an aircraft. Great, thank you. Um, so if for some reason, uh, the large aircraft platform that your report recommends um, NASA go with uh, were to be unavailable, so if we didn't have it for research, what do you think the impact would be on the decadal survey science questions that you considered? So, um, John or Jim or Ann, Sarah? You want to take the first cut? Anne, please. I think one of the impacts um, from the perspective in the coupled water and energy cycle part of the report is um, we identified the, a DC-8-like uh, aircraft that could support the SBG, the surface biology and geology uh, mission development and um, calibration and validation. If we didn't have that capacity for a large uh, heavy lift, long duration aircraft, we would, I think, really miss out on, on the ability to do CalVal in places like the polar regions, which are the fastest changing, you know, due to climate change. And, and that, that has a uh, really important bearing, so. John? Yeah, I uh, want to mention that, um, you know, even for the uh, geological hazard, or surface dynamics, we uh, in the past demonstrated experiences we used the small aircraft. So that's the prefer use because one of the important things is to uh, rapid development and uh, we can uh, particularly use the radar data in our weather conditions. But however, if you don't, we currently all the small aircraft, you can only put host one sensor, one band of sensor. So the Earth system like to say, how about we put multiple bands of radar data for uh, different application, for different uh, uh, purpose, for example, to get the digital elevation model, to look at repeat past the data, to look at the definition dynamics. Without a large aircraft, you cannot accommodate multiple radar sensors alone with, without mentioning the inclusion of optical data and other data on the same time. We'll yeah. keep adding to this to this discussion, and it's always best that we each speak from our discipline. That's why we brought together so many great scientists from different areas. But you know, you look at the the DC-8 as it exists, and and our field uh, fills the plane and and continues to want more. Uh, and so, adding uh, that fire radiated power measurement on the DC-8 
uh, would not be possible with any other aircraft. So we wouldn't be able to do atmosphere and the fire itself. And also notice that when we do our, our campaigns, we're looking at trace gases, aerosols, radiation budget, weather. It really is already interdisciplinary because so many of the things that we're doing rely on us looking at multiple aspects of what's going on in the atmosphere. And so a smaller aircraft would mean a step backwards, really, in terms of the breadth with which we could look at uh, various phenomena with simultaneous measurements. Sarah, do you have something you would like to add? Well, I think I just emphasize the um, for work, say, um, on sea level rise, or and uh, there's a lot of uncertainty about what the next approaches should be, and uh, having a large aircraft provides ways to to do unexpected or things or to uh, tackle emerging science. Uh, so we may not know exactly what we get from it, but there's a lot of um, confidence that having a large aircraft will allow us to do science that we haven't foreseen yet. And then last of all, there, there's this issue of capacity to essentially tackle unexpected uh, events that, have, that are critical in, in terms of society, economics and, and, and whatnot. And so without that, um, uh, uh, as Sarah said, the ozone hole, that, that would have been delayed if that capability hadn't have been there. And that means that really the recovery of the ozone hole would have been delayed and there would have been uh, societal issues associated with that. So ha having that ability to respond fairly quickly and really resolve uh, quest uh, questions in your system like this is really important. Thank you all. Um, our next question is, uh, can you give me some examples of the type of science that large aircraft can do that persistent low earth orbit satellites cannot? Well, I think everyone has examples. Who would like to go first? <laughs> and do you want to go first? Uh, Zhang have his, has his hand up. Oh, so sorry. I with him. Go ahead. Go ahead, John. Okay, I think one of the thing, for example, uh, all the for the geological hazards. So we one of the primary use of uh, um, remote sensing data to look at the surface stuff measure associated with the various geologic processes, understanding the mechanism and even sometimes the use of uh, predicted uh, you know capacity. So all the satellites actually is all waiting from north to south. And uh, if uh, uh, and then there's one uh, uh, there's a uh, one component. If the ground movement is moving north to south, the satellite really is not sensitive. So on the other hand, if you fly aircraft east to west, you can be very sensitive to that component of ground information. And there are some other purposes as well. So this is the really the the, the flexible agile geometry of urban sensor really complements and actually enhance the characterization of geological hazards by mirroring the, the, the characteristics from different viewing geometry and uh, a different time scale. Okay, so I, I, I did want to add something about this multi-scale component. So, you know, LEO, low Earth orbit satellites are great and we want that because it does provide us with high spatial resolution and at the same time, multi-scale information is really important and critical for understanding fundamental scaling relationships and, and being able to, to characterize the process at the scale of the process, which is something that you can do with a more agile aircraft. And th that's probably going to require maybe multiple aircraft, so aircraft flying at different elevations and stacking them or, you know, a variety of ways that we can do that, perhaps in conjunction with a low Earth orbit satellite. Um, so we want to be able to represent the, the processes, in my case, in the water and energy cycles at the scale of the process. And the scale of observation by, from a satellite is fixed and not necessarily representative of the scale, the temporal or spatial scale of the process that's occurring. And that's especially important when you have um, events such as uh, flooding going on. 
um, or even longer term extreme events like uh, drought, where you really need to kind of understand in different ways how the drought is occurring. Um, so I'll stop there. I think somebody else had a, a comment on this. Yeah, this is Jim. I'll, I'll actually build on what Anne's saying because I think it's very important. And, and so I was going back to read the question to make sure I understood it. And I want to challenge the basis for the question altogether, which is that satellites and aircraft are meant to substitute for each other. And when you look in the document and look into the deeper discussion about observing systems, you begin to see that each plays a role and that each looks at something different. From space, you see, at least for atmospheric chemistry, you can count on my fingers how many things you can see, but from the aircraft, we measure hundreds of things. And also, when you're looking through the atmosphere, you're measuring the total amount of what's in the atmosphere. Uh, vertical profile information is very uh, difficult to achieve, whereas aircraft can profile in situ and provide great information. And then at the ground, it's a very different story. When you're trying to regulate something like air quality, only a ground measurement can truly diagnose what someone's experienced on the ground level. And everything else is trying to help the satellite provide information relevant to that perspective. And so you really need to, to ask yourself how aircraft contribute to the different ways that we look at things and, and flesh out the picture scientifically. So. I'll just add that one of the things aircraft do is let us deploy instruments, which we're not able to do from um, low Earth satellites. So sensors that are dropped into the ocean or dropped through the atmosphere are really important from aircraft. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Um, our next question is, is also about the size of the aircraft. Um, could emphasis on making smaller instruments lead to more use of smaller aircraft? Do you think that large aircraft encourage large instruments? Jim. I, I don't, and, and, and here's why. Um, there's a reason the DCA is called a flying laboratory. Most of these instruments are moving directly from a lab onto the plane. Uh, these development timescales to make things uh, smaller are for things that you want to measure in perpetuity in a monitoring sense. But each time we fly a campaign, there are new instruments, there are new capabilities, there are things that we can't wait for in terms of making measurements in the atmosphere. That's what the large aircraft gives you the chance to do is to br bring science quality measurements to the atmosphere on very short time scales. Right, it, it literally is coming from the laboratory of, of people who are developing and have developed new technologies in terms of atmospheric measurements, but they aren't necessarily engineers that have experience with packaging it for small uh, platforms and whatnot initially. And so this is a perfect place, as Jim says, a flying laboratory to really try out these new concepts and then move forward from there. Thank you. Um, did your panel consider procurement, outfitting, and operational costs for a DC-8 replacement? Um, I'll answer that one. And, and this was not part of our statement of task was, didn't have it. we were essentially doing the science to what type of platform is needed to accomplish the science, and then what are what are the possible other smaller aircraft, and what uh, balloons and, and UASs can do, and then how what else might happen. That was really what we were tasked to do, and, and not with any of this other. Great, thank you for clarifying. Um, our next question. Uh, the audience says, in my experience, the NASA DC-8 has limitations with, it, with its available number of mid-year viewing ports relative to other NASA aircraft like the P-3. Was there any consideration toward recommending improved capabilities for hosting additional mid-year style remote sensing instruments in a future NASA large aircraft? Okay, anyone want to take that? Otherwise, I will. Anne? I'll just say we discussed it, and it was certainly something that came up, um, particularly in, in the Icebridge conversations. Um, Bill, did this make it into the report? I don't recall exactly. So, so um, if, you, if you look at, at our, our recommendation on, on uh, number two, which is the recommendation on what should the aircraft have, what we say in there explicitly is that we need this combination, unique combination of various characteristics, but really some of what is going to be necessary in the future isn't prescribed yet and it needs to be prescribed is what, what do we think 
when they put together and think about what kind of aircraft, when they put that together, they need to be thinking about where are the uses going to be. And this will help dictate where we go forward in the future when they make the decisions to, to move the aircraft and, 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 and uh, uh, choose an aircraft and then uh, retrofit it for, for the science. And so, so that wasn't something that we prescribed, nor should we prescribe in this report. But it's something that we left the possibility wide open that says, yeah, as things emerge, pay attention to it, please. Thank you. Um, so it looks like we have time for about two more questions. Um, the first, uh, could you elaborate more on your recommendation about training and engaging the next generation of researchers in airborne missions? So what kinds of workforce changes may, might we anticipate in Earth systems research? And how do you think a large aircraft um, best meets these goals? Jim or Ann? Um, one of the things that I, that I think the report emphasizes is that the DC-8 has already been playing this role. Uh, I was a graduate student on the DC-8 in 1991. So this idea that there's a new thing that the DC-8 is going to do is really more about making that better and trying to ensure that science teams include more and more involvement from young scientists who are going to become part of, uh, part of the workforce. And so from my perspective, over the years, things that have changed are that uh, we're more connected. And so we've opened up new roles for young people on these field campaigns, not just being graduate students on the plane making measurements, but now casting on the ground. More and more satellite data is used to guide the aircraft and having graduate students involved in that process is very important. And including graduate students in the field who are just uh, trying to help us gauge what the data is telling us. Uh, you know, you don't want to spend a month in the atmosphere uh, flying an aircraft to do something and come back and realize that you didn't get what you wanted. And so monitoring mission success along the way is an important thing to do. And data scrutiny, uh, opportunities to present in the field are all becoming more and more prevalent on these campaigns. And these DCA campaigns, when you have 100, 150 people in the field, uh, become great vehicles for not only exercising young people, but exposing them to the community and giving them a face and a voice uh, amongst uh, those of us who uh, are going to be, uh, you know, helping them out in the future. Yeah, I think that mentoring component is has been and, and will be uh, even more important. And the idea that you can have, you know, a large number of people involved in DC-8, on, on the DC-8, means that you're not alone. You're, you know, if you've got questions, you can ask. And so, um, these early career scientists, whether they're undergraduates, grad students, postdocs, or, or uh, early career um, researchers, um, they, can, they have people that they can work with directly. And the other component here is, um, you know, we, we, did, we did indicate that this is a, an opportunity for a more diverse, um, inclusive um, way to, to get um, underrepresented groups involved in, in all kinds of science in interdisciplinary or system science. And so we see this platform as also a way to increase the diversity of the, of our colleagues. All right. Thank you all. And sorry, go ahead. Oh, I, I think I just want to add it. I think, uh, you know, a lot of most of these data graduates we can grab here and there, but uh, putting them into the aircraft and let them do the designing and get the real-time data and then look at the anomalies. And I think that's a different experiences that will inspire them for, I mean, for, the, for, for, their, for their future work. I think that will definitely increase our, uh, you know, the potential that continue work on this remote field. I think that will be a tremendous experience for, for them. Fantastic. All right, well, as we wrap up here today um, and finish up our conversation, I just have one last question. Um, as uh, you release your report to the public this week and as you continue disseminating your findings and your recommendations as a committee, um, what are you most hoping that um, the people who use these NASA airborne platforms or the people who use the data that they gather, um, what are you hoping that they most take away from your report? Jim. 
I would just emphasize the scientific discourse that took place both in the, the decadal survey and the report, uh, reminding our communities to continue to put their ideas to the agency, to show them the ways the planes can be used to our advantage, and to continue to make sure that the fleet is well used and, and very busy in terms of the science that we want to pursue. And I'll, I'll add that um, I hope that pe the readers of this report will understand the value of the range of airborne science platforms that are available and we hope more will be available and that the DCA, this, this DCA like uh, platform has a really important role in the whole suite of platforms. But that airborne science is is a really, really important component for all of NASA research. And I'll, I'll just maybe uh, finish with this by saying we also hope that it inspires uh, scientists, early career scientists, existing scientists, to sort of really be innovative and in thinking about how can I really do a great job of not only my disciplinary research, but connecting to do interdisciplinary work as well. And I think that inspiration for new ideas and new approaches to get science data that's going to help us make societal decisions is really important. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for your presentation today and for um, taking questions, um, as well as for your work on the report, of course. Um, so uh, once we exit this webinar, just a reminder to our audience that you'll be redirected to our report page. Um, so with that, thank you again for participating. <laughs>